Have scientists and engineers built a true propellantless space drive? Welcome to Tech First with John Kutsir. All space travel to date operates on reaction engines, as in Newton's law, right? Every action produces an equal but opposite reaction. Essentially, you throw stuff behind you really, really fast and you move forward. That doesn't work very well for long trips. You can't store enough reaction mass. You can't take it all along. And all of it that you're taking has to be accelerated as well. So a physics professor and a few colleagues have built an experimental space drive that doesn't require reaction mass, just electricity. And NASA has actually invested in it as well. To unpack what's happening, what it means, what it looks like, we're chatting with Jim Woodward, who's a physics professor emeritus at Fullerton. Welcome, Jim. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It's a real pleasure to have you. I'm excited about this. I'm, I'm excited to learn. I mean, I've always loved space science fiction, science, and exploration. So this is exciting. Let's just start here. What have you built? Basically, what we built is what I refer to as gizmos because they've been evolving over the years. Uh, actually, it's been quite a few years since the first ideas were formulated and all that. It's been a long development process. What it comes down to is in the fall of 1989, I discovered a mistake that I had made in a calculation, which made me go back and look more carefully at some work that a Canadian electrical engineer actually had done back in the early 1950s. And what I discovered was that there was a possible mathematical path to making something move. And you've already got the <laughs> video up. Of the thing moving it's going to wiggle yes there it goes wiggling okay theoretically unless there's something called a slip stick mechanism operating that device should not wiggle it's actually got an internal component that i'll explain in a few minutes called a lick of a stack of uh, lead zirconium titanate discs in it that vibrates through a few hundred nanometers amplitude at about 35 kilohertz, 30 to 35 kilohertz. Uh, that is to say, ultrasonically. Uh, and it should not move. It should no. just sit there and wiggle. The wiggling is so small, it should not move. The fact that you actually see it move on the tracks, and it's good to have it up front so that there's no surprise lurking down the line, the fact that it moves on the steel dowels that support it is evidence for the existence of this unusual effect that I blundered onto by discovering a mistake back in the fall of 1989. Of course, all of it got took a long time to get worked out and all that, and I suppose we'll talk a little bit about that. But that's really the, the nub of the whole thing. I succeeded in convincing a number of colleagues that this is sufficiently interesting that it's worth investing some effort in working on it. Uh, it's passed muster with, uh, in particular, a friend of mine who's a world-class general relativist. So I'm certain that I haven't done anything really incredibly stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always a problem, of course, if you're inventing something that has never, ever been seen before, never been tempted, attempted or, or, or conceived of even. You, you wonder, I mean, am, am I the crazy one here? Is something really, did I get something wrong? What's going on? Can you explain uh, what is happening? So I'll, I'll bring that up again and we'll run it. And this is a test video that you've shared with me. And you've got uh -huh. your drive unit essentially there. It's running right now. Uh -huh. You see it moving. What is happening physically to make that move? Okay. You've got some uh, visuals that I sent you that probably will help a little bit with this. It's called the core test article or something or the core drive or something like that. Uh, let me Here, explain. Let me that. Yeah, let, while you're fooling around with that, let me explain the underlying physics. Basically, what I discovered in the fall of 1989 was that the field equation, 
that had been invented by this Canadian George Luchak back in the early 50s, which is just Newtonian, rel Newtonian gravity written in relativistic terms, okay, consistent with special relativity, was that there was a term in his field equation which was not a standard field equation form. Mm -hmm. it, and when I discovered what its origin was, its origin was inertia. Okay, this term was present because if gravity is inertial in origin, then it has to be there. Uh, when you do some mathematical manipulations with that realization, you can put the field equation into standard form, but you end up with a couple of extra terms which have to go on the source side of the equation. Yes. They're transient terms. You can't just turn something on and leave it on and then turn it off. You have to constantly make stuff change in order to make the term have an effect. And when you stop doing that, it goes away and everything looks exactly the way it was before. Uh, but those transient source terms are the basis of this effect. So in effect, what you do is you build the device that allows you to change the rest mass of a stack of lead zirconium titanate crystals, okay, so that they're a little bit more massive at part of the cycle and a little less massive during part of the cycle. And that change in the mass couples to an enormous gravitational field that's present in all of our lives all the time. You know, we've all been living in this, well, actually, uh, it's been around since the inception of the universe. Yeah. It's, it's the gravitational field of what Ernst Mach called cosmic matter or the fixed stars. Uh, <coughs> it turns out that that field, if it properly accounts for inertia, as Einstein insisted that it did in general relativity, <coughs> That field is utterly gigantic. It has a strength that's comparable to the gravitational field at the black, that the event horizon of a black hole. Yes. Uh, but since it's the same everywhere, you don't detect it except when you try and push something, then it pushes back. Okay, that's what causes inertia. The strength of that field in terms of the so-called Newtonian potential is equal to the square of the vacuum speed of light, okay, which is gigantic. That's the horizon condition for a black hole. Wow. Uh, you know, so inertial effects have very much larger consequences than what we normally think of as gravity, where it takes the entire Earth to pull you down with one G of acceleration and all that, okay? Gravitational fields, as we normally think of them in Newtonian physics and indeed in general relativity, except when you're talking about black holes or neutron stars, uh, are relatively weak. The standard comparison is the force of attraction between two electrons as compared to their electromagnetic interaction of repulsion. The force of attraction is typically about 40 orders of magnitude smaller than the electrical interaction. Mm -hmm. This is the problem in trying to get around space-time quickly, finding a way to get around that 40 order of magnitude problem. <laughs> okay? yeah. The way you do it is by using inertia, because inertial effects, because C squared has a magnitude <laughs> of, well, in SI units is about the 10 to the 18th, okay, meters per second, meters squared per second squared. You know, it's, it's a very large number, okay. So if you use inertial effects and try, instead of trying to deal with gravity as you normally think of it, you've already got 20 orders of magnitude roughly solved, which wow. really helps, <laughs> okay. Okay, core device. The thing that you saw wiggling on the rails that wiggled a little bit. No, back to the first slide. Right up to the yeah, top? Yeah, right up to the top. Next one down. Okay. 
conceptually, the way this works is that there are three elements in the device that you saw on the rails. Yep. There's on the right, a fluctuating mass. This is a mass in which you excite this fluctuation where it's a little more massive and less massive periodically. Mm -hmm. Okay. What that works out to be in the earliest devices was a ring of capacitors, which you charge and discharge at some frequency. Okay. And the charging and discharging makes the mass fluctuate, but only if you have an actuator, the A in the middle of the diagram, which causes them to accelerate while they are charging and discharging periodically. Okay, at the same frequency of the charging and discharging. Okay, now to get the actuator to actually push the fluctuating mass and make it accelerate, you have to have a third component, which is called the reaction mass, RM, hmm. this diagram. So what you have is, let me show you this. This is one of these new devices. The brass piece that you see in there, Yes. That's the reaction mass. Okay. This is not complete. It has more parts to go on it. But as you can see, it's designed so it can wiggle on these springs that mount it. Okay. And that's part of one of the breakthroughs in this business. Okay. The reaction mass, and then you have the actuator. I've got one of those here. This is a stack of PCT crystals. Mm -hmm. okay. Here it is. This one's actually a bad stack. It's about to get crashed. <laughs> okay. And then you have a cap which bolts the PZT stack onto the reaction mass. Yes. Okay. Preloads it. Now you'd say, gee, those are only two components. You've got a reaction mass and an actuator. What's the fluctuating mass? The trick discovered early on in this was that the actuator can be both the actuator and the fluctuating mass at the same time. Wow. Because if you go down a couple of slides, two or three slides. Uh, okay, that's... Okay, PZT stacks, back one, there it is. Those disks on the left are the lead zirconium titanate crystals, in fact, used in a PZT stack. And the brass piece on the side is the electrode on the right. Okay. They're polarized. There are little red marks on the discs which indicate positive polarity. And when you put them together into a PZT stack, and there's a picture of one in the next slide, which is probably easier to see than me holding the thing in my hand. Okay. <laughs> That's what a completed stack looks like. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. When you apply an alternating voltage, to the uh, yellow and black heavy leads in the picture that you're looking at now, okay, it will cause the stack to extend and contract periodically at hmm. the applied voltage frequency, okay? The other leads are for a strain gauge, which is mounted in the stack, so you can actually watch what's going on in the stack at the time. Okay, right. next slide is you put that PZT stack on a reaction mass and a cap, which preloads it onto the reaction mass. And then you just apply a voltage. The next picture shows you the those parts, okay? And the next picture is of a completed device of an earlier design. It's not the parts that I showed you holding them up between my thumb and forefinger. Yes. Okay. That was what we were experimenting with up until last June, okay, mm -hmm. this type of device. It's fairly simple. We discovered a couple of important things along the way. One was that if you use Steiner Martin's SM111 PZT material, okay, no, you're down to the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get to that in a moment. Steiner Martin's SM111 has a really neat property. If you apply a single frequency sine wave to the stack and you get just the right circumstances, it will cause harmonics, higher harmonics to come into existence. In particular, the second harmonic, because what you need to produce a force from something that has a fluctuating mass is another force 
which operates at twice the frequency of the applied voltage to the stack because the applied voltage to the stack produces the mass fluctuation at twice the frequency. If you now have a double frequency mechanical oscillation, you can push on it when it's more massive and pull it back when it's less massive. You've got propellant, but you don't have to throw it over and say goodbye. Okay. <laughs> you get to throw it over when it's more massive. And then because of this interaction with this inertial gravitational field, you can let it become less massive and then pull it back in. And then you Amazing. do the same thing over again. And you just do it over and over and over again. 35 so in, in a really, a second. really simplified way, what you're doing essentially is making something slightly more massive when it's in a certain position, making it slightly less massive when you're pulling it back, and therefore you're using the inertial field that's all around us to We're essentially move a vehicle. Is that correct? Got it. That's it. That's all there is to it. You know, it's this weird consequence of these transient terms in this field equation that I blundered on to 30 years ago. <laughs> it's those weird transient terms. They get multiplied by the local gravitational potential, but the local gravitational potential in general relativity is not just the potential due to local stuff. It's a potential due to everything in the universe. Yes. And it yes. has a value of C squared which wow. vastly amplifies what otherwise would be a hopelessly undetectable effect. Okay. If just special relativity were true, you'd never be able to see this. Okay. It's that coupling to that field that we all live in. And we detect every time we push on something, it pushes back. That's what pushes back. Okay. So, you know, I was looking for a way of doing this, but I had no idea that that was be how it would turn out to work. When I was before the fall of 1989, I was looking for what in the field of exotic propulsion is called anomalies. I was looking for an anomaly in the coupling of electromagnetism and gravity that would allow you to get some purchase to do the same sort of thing. It never occurred to me that you didn't need an anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All, so, you need, all you need to all you need is to look at this field equation, say, gee, that term doesn't look right. That's not the technical term for it is that's not the, the time like part of a Dalembertian. <laughs> and then say, <laughs> ah, gee, but maybe we can get extract the time like part of the Dalembertian from that term. And when you do that, which is possible only because of this gravitational aspect of inertia, okay, when you do that, you get these added transient terms that end up on the source side. Mm -hmm. okay, so mm -hmm. you don't need an anomalous interaction between electromagnetism and gravity. You just need to realize that there's this quirk in the mathematics, okay? And I'd like to tell you that it was brilliance and genius and all the rest of that, but it wasn't. It was just dumb damn luck. <laughs> <laughs> Never underestimate luck. Never underestimate yeah. the sheer power of luckiness to, to stumble on something. Oh, so yeah. you've you've you you've devised um, some theory here. You've 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 built uh, an experimental model. Uh, we saw that there are some effects happening here. I want to ask um, how much thrust if we can call it that are, are you generating how much how much um power are you generating and how many of these would you need to be operational in some kind <laughs> of um spaceship in the vacuum okay okay number one it's not my theory it's einstein's theory i just okay. did a good, good, good. i just did a calculation <laughs> no i constantly have to correct people on this oh you've got a really neat theory no, it's not my theory. You know, I'd <laughs> like good to be news. able to tell you that it was. Yes. Yeah. The reason <laughs> That's really why we're here is because a lot of people know about Einstein. A lot of people have tested his equations and they've mostly withstood the test of time. Yes. Yeah. Only, well, there's, there's some historical quirks in this that make it a little, a little bit more challenging to get this across than ought to be the case, but we'll ignore them. Uh, 
actually your viewers, if they want, can do a calculation for themselves to get the amount of thrust. The device that they saw in the video, and I think there are two of them, and the other one may be a little bit more obvious, but the device, the device, these devices, when they're working right, uh, displace the device at in the 30 kilohertz region uh, by somewhere between a half a millimeter and a millimeter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the amplitude of the excursion produced by the thrust is on the order of a millimeter or so. Okay. That excursion takes place in about the time of a 30 second per frame film, uh, camera, video cam. It's a webcam that's taking these pictures. Actually, a Logitech Brio, which is much better than the previous Logitech. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's moving about half a millimeter to a millimeter. It does that in about the time of one frame. That is to say 30 milliseconds. Okay. And the mass of the device is about 125 grams. Okay. So knowing the mass, the delta T, there it goes. <laughs> doing its thing. <laughs> you know, uh you can sit down and do the calculation. If you do that calculation, what you'll find is that the force speed that is necessary to move 125 grams a millimeter or so in 30 milliseconds is on the order of a few hundred millinewtons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not claiming a few hundred millinewtons yet. <laughs> yeah. But we're counting on being able, hopefully, part of our problem is that this is a very high Q system, so you can't just turn it on to a frequency and then just turn it on and have it produce thrust steadily at that frequency because it heats up and as soon as it starts heating up, it drifts off the resonance. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, those of us who are still working on this, David Jenkins in the Sacramento area, an electrical engineer who's developing a very light, very high power amplifier that will eventually go on an air sled that's being built by Michelle Broyles in, uh, oh God, it's near Evergreen, Colorado. Okay, she's putting together the air sled, which is a frictionless system. It's basically, we're gonna put everything on the sled with the except oh. some, tele, some telemetered uh, pre-amplifier signal generation and the preamplifier signal locking yes mercy my cat it's <laughs> okay <laughs> decided to to chime in here uh, she's allowed paul, <laughs> paul march in uh friendswood texas is developing the preamplifier arbitrary waveform generator stage of this okay the reason why they're doing that is because a little gizmo that you just showed if you're me and you've run the thing and all that you know that it's not working on a slipstick mechanism okay but anybody else looking at it being a good skeptic would say gee maybe it's a slipstick mechanism mm -hmm. and there are arguments that you can make that it's not but it's much better if you can just put on something where slipstick mechanisms are functionally impossible and then show that the thing still accelerates that's in progress right now uh we hope within a month or two to have the air sled running and all that uh we also have by the way anticipating one of the questions is anybody else checking up on this uh george hathaway of hathaway research in ontario canada has a couple of these devices and is Indeed, probably as we speak, working on checking up on them. And uh, NIAC, uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, from which we had a couple of grants over the last few years. Uh, NIAC is contracting with a fellow named Mike McDonald, who does pr propulsion work for the Navy at NRL. Uh, he's scheduled, assuming that we're still showing something that really works and all that by the time the contract starts, he's going to be doing, he's going to be checking up on us too. So, Excellent. Uh, 
we're we're trying to build something that will really work as opposed to something that we can fool around with it and have fun and all that and it ends up sitting on a shelf and doesn't go anywhere. So, uh, so let's get really theoretical for a second. I understand that you're 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 building a device, you 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 you're seeing some activity, it's getting tested by multiple other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and people are trying in different environments, the air sled that you talked about as well, to ensure that there's a real force happening here. Right. Let's assume that goes well. Let's assume that you can maybe even scale it up a little bit more. Um, what kind of force do you need to move um, a rocket? And I'm not talking about taking out off out of a gravity well, you know, lifting off oh, off yeah. of Earth or something like that. I'm talking about something that is already in orbit or has been flung, you know, out of orbit even by perhaps a starter motor, a chemical reaction motor or something. But you want to accelerate the, the travel to, let's say, Mars or some of the other planets. You know, how 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 much force can you get out of this? How many can you stack up? I mean, what are the limitations here? What do you need to do? You can stack up as many as you physically have space for. These things with the frame that the mounts them are about six centimeters on a side, a cube, six centimeters on a side. So they're very small. Uh, The figure of merit for these things is given in newtons per kilowatt. Okay, how much force for a kilowatt of input energy? <clears throat> These things operate with a reactive power that's a few hundred watts, but the actual power dissipated in making the thing do its thing uh, it turns out to be less than a watt. And if that back of the envelope calculation is correct, <coughs> of, of 100 millinewtons or thereabouts, okay. You're talking about a figure of merit that would be on the order of what? Well, it's 100 millinewtons uh, times a thousand mm-hmm. would be the number of newtons per kilowatt. Uh, so, 100 millinewtons, uh, 10 newtons per kilowatt. 10 newtons per kilowatt is approaching heavy lift. Okay, wow. you don't need to chemical rocket to put these things in orbit when you get them working really well. You can just climb in your thing and turn the thing on. That's amazing. Motor up at, at some convenient. I had zero concept that that would be possible when I read some of your research and the work that was going on. I was assuming you'd always need a chemical rocket to get out of a gravity well, especially Earth, you know, maybe not so much Mars or the moon or something like that. But I mean, if you could scale up to that point, then you're essentially you electricity is all that you yeah, need. It's a space you run drive. your rocket. It's the ultimate EV, right? It's the ultimate electric yeah. vehicle. You can go anywhere in the uh, yes. solar system, at least. Yes. Yeah. No, you can actually use it for interstellar missions too. But there are a lot of other technical issues you have to worry about then, because if you use these things to achieve some cent- reasonable fraction of the speed of light. Then you have to figure out what you're going to do about deflecting junk that you encounter while traveling <laughs> near light speed. <laughs> yeah. And that's a problem which I have not devoted a lot of thought to, other than to note that, you know, even a small pebble hitting your craft, <laughs> if you're going at 40% of the speed of light, is enough to produce a large explosion. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. That's somebody else's problem, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Yes. Uh, and the, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, interstellar is amazing. And I'm sure that, you know, if we can develop this, this drive and this effect, um, then there's, there's some amazing possibilities for probes in uh, on the horizon uh, for something like that. But for uh, crude travel, uh, probably yes. our solar system is, is the next more like yeah. yes. what's that the next few for the next few years, the first application of these things, assuming that we can solve some technical difficulties, which do not involve unknown unknowns. They're just known unknowns. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is to say they're in principle tractable and, and we can be reasonably certain that they can be solved. Yes. Uh, the first application would be for satellite uh orbital change and positioning and collision avoidance and stuff like that. Things that produce 
in fact, on the order of a few hundred millinewtons or thereabouts. And to do that, if you can get everything working in the electronics, you can do it with a single device of this sort. Okay, centimeter, six, six centimeters on a side cube, plus the electronics and other associated hardware. Uh, <laughs> these can be run in arrays. Okay, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. make a whole bunch of them, and mount them on something. Actually, I was thinking that for production engineering, you'd probably want to figure out how to make them so that they can be plugged in to some array holder so that when one goes bad, you just go and pull it out and stick another one in. Replace a yeah. component. The satellite usage is ingenious because, I mean, we, we lose satellites because they run out of reaction propellant. mass propellant to maintain their orbit, right? And maintain their ability yeah. to uh, aim in the right direction, other things like that. Um, yeah. Very, very interesting. And we know that we can build super long lasting probes as well. I mean, the Voyagers are <laughs> still, uh, <laughs> some of them are still running. Yeah, and you got solar arrays as power source. You don't have to worry about fooling around with some compact nuclear reactor or something like that. If you're talking about getting to the outer solar system or ultimately interstellar missions, which is what these are ultimately aimed at, okay, I call them impulse engines because you're impulse. Yes. <laughs> Hanging on the thing over and over again. Uh, actually, my colleague... Hal Fern, who's been working with me for the past eight years or so, uh, likes to call them mock effect gravity assist impulse engines or mega impulse engines. You know, and that's fine with me. That sounds pretty good. You know, yeah. uh, but these things are not are not warp drives or wormhole generators. Unfortunate, they, unfortunate. I, I, I they, would love to visit Alpha Centauri or, or something like that. You know, I mean, just the near step through a wormhole. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They well, point the way to physics that may make that possible. Okay. Because the re, re understanding of general relativity, when you include inertia the way Einstein intended that it be included in general relativity points away to uh, the possibility of negative mass. One of the transient terms in that equation I told you about is negative definite. And if you can do certain manipulations in just the right way, you can trigger this normally minuscule term and bring it up to amazingly large <laughs> values. Wow. Yeah, so, so Wormholes and warp drives are not off the table as a result of this, but my guess is that people will make mega impulse engines <laughs> and go tooling around and have their flying cars and all the rest of that <laughs> long before somebody figures out some clever way. Of, but of course, that's probably not right. That's probably because I'm old and conservative. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Some, Let's some talk clever about young, just some <laughs> clever young person likely to come along and say, "Oh, gee, well, if we do this that, and the other thing, you know, we should be able to do so and so." You know? but, yes, yes. Uh, we'll hope for uh, more happy coincidences, maybe, and some lucky discoveries and other things that just stumble upon. <laughs> I want to ask you about this personally. Um, obviously this has been your life's work. You stumbled on something, um, and you've, you've toiled away at it for literally decades. Um, and then found that there is something here and, and others are testing that as well right now, uh, as you talked about already, uh, what's your, what's your, your personal mission here? And, you know, if you, if you, uh, were to have a working mock engine in your possession right now on a, uh, space travel, uh, able, uh, ship, where would you go? <laughs> Good questions. Uh, I guess probably the if, if answer to the first question is why did I devote my life to this? Because seemingly, especially even to a youngster, uh, it would appear to be impossible and a waste of time. <laughs> uh, the answer to that question actually is, is uh, included with a slight embellishment 
in Dan Oberhaus's long, Wired Long Read that came out earlier this fall. Uh, I'd been interested in physics and generally the question of how to get around space time quickly and all that from my late undergraduate days and graduate school. And during a hiatus in graduate school where I <laughs> played flamenco guitar for a while, <laughs> I ended up on the rooftop uh, patio of a pension in the Barrio Santa Cruz in Sevilla uh, in March of 1967, I guess it was. And back in 1967, satellite, satellite spotting was a uh, popular activity. Okay, nowadays it's you see a satellite passing overhead and it's ho-hum, what else is new? You know, but back in 1967, they were still... There weren't a lot of them either, for that matter. But they there were, were enough. Big ones. <laughs> yeah, but they were big, and there were enough of them so that if you watched the sky for 10 or 15 minutes, you had a chance of seeing something. And uh, one night, we were all up on the rooftop patio, and I watched this satellite. And having had a course in astronomy and a mother who was an astronomer, uh, I knew how to predict great circles and all that. So I made a rough calculation on the basis of my in initial watching of the satellite passing overhead of where it would continue along its normal satellite path. And as I watched, the thing started slowly deviating from the great circle path that I had pretty firmly established from my initial observations. You know. And it changed the plane of its orbit by an excess of about 40 or 50 degrees while I watched it. And uh, oh, sometime in the preceding month or two, I'd read an article in either International Time or Newsweek about satellites. And they had remarked that commercial satellites could change the plane of their orbit by a degree or two. And that it was speculated that military hardware might be able to change the plane of its orbits by... 10 or 12 degrees, but certainly nothing more than that, because it takes a lot of energy to change the plane of the orbit of a satellite. It's not something where you just say, oh, gee, I think I'll go that way and you know, so on, because you, after all, you've got a fair amount of mass and you're traveling at 17,000 miles per hour, okay? <laughs> which is a lot of momentum, and you have to redirect all that momentum. You know? So I knew that there was nothing... <laughs> that we had built that could possibly do what this satellite had done. And, I, and it occurred to me, though it didn't occur to any of my friends, that somebody knew how to do something that we didn't know how to do. You know, and I thought, gee, if I'm interested in gravity. I was unusual in that regard as an undergraduate. Gravity was in the mid early to mid-1960s, only just becoming a big field in the area of physics. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. I, I said, well, gee, that looks like something that ought to be interesting. See if I can figure out how they did that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then I worried about so, getting, getting a job and stuff like that. <laughs> so I found my way with this as an avocation and all that that uh, took up such spare time as I had. And I worked on it a long time. I had a professor at NYU, Malvin Ruderman, who I asked some questions about general relativity once. And I told him I was having a hard time with it because, you know, I'm not that smart. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. Everybody has a hard time with it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Even those who are really smart have a hard time with it. So, uh, he said, I'm sure, you want I'm to be the very humble. To, <laughs> I'm yeah. sure that was very humble of you. But let's say that no, you no, 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 no. Let me finish the story. He okay. said, if you want to be the world's expert in something, pick a really hard problem and be prepared to work on it for years. Okay. Nice. He said, really smart people you don't have to worry about because they won't try and scoop you until you've shown that you can actually do something with it. <laughs> <laughs> And he was right. <laughs> there are a lot of us out there trying to figure out how to do this, and and you know I've been I've been more lucky than than I suppose most people have. 
So. Well, I'm glad you have been. Um, so let's let's go to the second half of the question now. Um, okay, where would I go? You've got a working um, ship, spaceship, um, with this uh, new propulsion system actually functioning and working. Uh, where do you go? Actually, the first ship, I stay here on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Earth is really a pretty nice place when you get well right down to it. We're working on it, but it's still a pretty nice place. You know? And remember that space junk, you have to have a pretty good way of deflecting the space sure. junk and all that. Sure. So probably for the first ship or two, I'd stay here and make sure that you know it doesn't get blasted to smithereens because the deflection system failed and <laughs> yes. Yes. got taken out by got taken out by a marble sized object or something like that. But once they got them working and all that, uh, where would I go? You know, I haven't really thought about that very much. Uh, if you could really actually do deep space exploration, what would you do? The obvious answer is to take a close look at the outer solar system because this would make outer solar system travel relatively straightforward and not that expensive. You know? mm -hmm. uh, that would be the obvious place. Lagrange points or the uh, gravitational focal lens point of mm -hmm. the sun uh, would be another obvious place to go. Use the sun's gravitational field as a lens in effect to uh, image stuff very, very much farther away. Uh, interstellar missions, the obvious key candidate is Proxima Centauri, uh, which, as I understand it, it's got it's a red dwarf and it's got a habitable zone planet that you know might be worth taking a look at. Okay, amazing. Uh, but to be honest with you, initially the motivation was. It was like looking at the answers in the back of a textbook. You know, you know what you know what the answer is. And then you have to figure out how to get to the answer from what you know. You know, that was that was the main thing, and I didn't worry about the other stuff. Uh, <coughs> Very cool. Then, 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 what I discovered was I anticipated I figured that I would be attacked for. Uh, <laughs> the transient sources and all of that. And it turns out that has only marginally been the case. Mainly what I get attacked for is saying Einstein was right about inertia, which I must admit has really surprised me. You know, <laughs> uh, the, he was right about inertia. It really is a gravitational effect. You know, and I did not expect that. I, as a matter of fact, when I figured that out, you know, I figured I might be professionally rehabilitated a little bit <laughs> because I wasn't I wasn't attacking general relativity anymore in the eyes of people in the mainstream. Yes, uh, and it didn't work out that way because the mainstream had decided, while all of this was going on in my own life, the mainstream had decided that inertia is not gravitationally induced. <laughs> you know, and well, that they're wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that question to another day. Um, I'm just uh, super happy to have had the chance to chat with you and turn, learn a little bit more about the mock engine and what you're doing, how you've been working on it, some of the theory behind it and some of the potential behind it as well uh, if if i got that working spacecraft oh somebody wants to talk to you <laughs> yeah i know let me turn it off no worries if i got that spacecraft i think i would do sort of a new grand tour of all the planets and certainly go to jupiter and try not get fried by its uh, <laughs> em fields and all that stuff yeah. and um, but uh, check out Europa, uh, many other things. I want to thank you for spending this time with us, James. I really do appreciate the time that you've shared and the insights that you've shared, and I wish you the very best success in the future uh, with getting this scaled up to an actual prototype that, we can, that NASA can test in space. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, you know, and 
grace of the great spirit, these things will continue to work. Let me mention real briefly my favorite Einstein quote. Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Yes. There's an awful lot of coincidence in life. You know, it's just recognizing that you have been lucky enough to, to have happened upon a coincidence. You know, as I'm a historian of science as well as doing this sort of stuff. And you know, being lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and all that probably is more important than anything else than in the process of discovery. You know, just anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about it. It is totally my pleasure. Uh, for everybody else, thank you for joining us on Tech First as well. My name is John Katsir. I appreciate you being along for the show. You'll be able to get a transcript of this podcast in about a week at johnkatsir.com. The story at Forbes will show up after that. Plus, the full video is always available on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining. Until next time, this is John Katsir with Tech First. Music